There is no art which one government sooner learns of another than that of draining money from the pockets of the people. Adam Smith, The Wealth of Nations. Hello and welcome back. Chapter 17 tells the amazing and never sufficiently praised adventure of the lions. It's one of my favorites. Sancho provides what at first appears to be a minor slapstick detail. He has just purchased curds from some nearby shepherds, and in his haste, he places them in Don Quixote's helmet. Don Quixote requests his helmet as he prepares for combat. Meanwhile, Miranda thinks Don Quixote is about to attack a cart carrying King Philip III's money. He saw nothing but a wagon coming towards them with two or three small banners, which led him to conclude that said wagon must have been carrying His Majesty's money, and he said as much to Don Quixote. There is a multiple irony here that has to do with our different perceptions of reality. Don Quixote responds to Miranda's warning by observing that one should always be prepared for the worst. A man forewarned has won half the battle. He observes that threats are often invisible. I know from experience that I have enemies both visible and invisible, and I do not know when, nor where, nor at what point, nor in what guise they will attack me. At this same time, he places his helmet on his head, and suddenly he thinks that his brains are melting. When Don Quixote accuses Sancho of treachery, the squire claims that he too has been the victim of secret enemies. I too must have enchanters who pursue me, since I'm a member and cut from the same fabric as your grace. This is all hilarious, but Cervantes is also laying the grounds for another highly symbolic episode, which has to do with brains in relation to combat. In other words, cogitation as a means of preparing for unknown threats. Let's look more closely at this threat. Don Quixote is prepared to do battle with Satan himself in person. The driver informs Don Quixote that the wagon contains two brave lions in cages, which the general of Oran is sending to court as a gift to his majesty. An autobiographical note here, Cervantes himself undertook a mysterious mission to Oran in 1581, which likely involved espionage or diplomacy, or both. Did you know? In 1580, the Habsburgs imported a machine to Spain known as the Royal Device of Segovia, Real Ingenio de Segovia, which industrialized the process of minting small, denominated coins. This led to what is considered the first modern attempt at fiat currency. To continue, Don Quixote is clearly confronting a symbolic extension of the royal personage. The banners are those of our lord the king, a sign that what's here is his. But our mad Hidalgo doesn't back down. You come at me with little lions? Like we've come up against the church, Sancho, this phrase is now a refrain that expresses determination in the face of danger. The Green Knight tries to stop Don Quixote, but his words also reinforce the political nature of the conflict. These lions are not challenging your grace or even dreaming of doing so. They are gifts to his majesty, and it's not wise to detain them or impede their journey. Don Quixote refuses to let others determine what he knows. I know whether or not these lordly lions are challenging me. What is the nature of this political conflict? We have already seen an allusion to money. Note that the poverty of the driver is also at issue. I will be ruined for life, for I have no other property than this wagon and these mules. The real issue here, what Don Quixote knows that he knows, is that King Philip III's inflationary monetary policy is devastating to poor people, savers, and people on fixed incomes. Don Quixote's response contains a deeper level of meaning related to poverty and savings. Straight away, you shall see that you labored in vain and could have spared yourself the effort. The episode's monetary language continues when the lion keeper emphasizes the potential costs to Don Quixote. He says that if Don Quixote persists in his challenge, he will have to compensate him for his salary and his fees. I protest to this gentleman that he is responsible and accountable for all harm and damage that these beasts might cause, as well as for my salaries and fees. Again, Don Quixote responded that he knew what he was doing. 
At this point, Cide Amete expresses his highest praise for Don Quixote anywhere in the entire novel. It's a long paragraph. Francisco Rico even notes a certain Hebraic hyperbole. O oh, most valiant and courageous knight beyond all estimations, with what words shall I relate this fearsome feat? What phrases can I use to make it credible for future generations? What praises can I find that will not suit and befit you, even if they be the most hyperbolic of all hyperboles? Let your very deeds sing your praises, valiant Manchegan, for I shall leave them here in all their glory, for I lack the words with which to esteem them. Why now? Why does this particular episode cause Cide Amete to produce such inflated praise? Everyone flees in fear, but the lion is unfazed. He displayed his hindquarters to Don Quixote, and with great serenity and calm, he went back inside the cage. Don Quixote now urges the lion keeper to poke the lion. He refuses, and Don Quixote declares victory. Now Don Quixote signals the others to return with the same white cloth that he had used to wipe the curds from his face. Paradoxically, this seems like a signal of surrender. This white cloth, in conjunction with the lion's disinterest in engaging Don Quixote, would seem to indicate that inflation is too subtle to be defeated. The king's policy means he wins, no matter what you do. Nevertheless, as the driver returns, Don Quixote makes an impertinent gesture. Sancho, give two gold escudos to the man, one for him and one for the lion keeper, in recompense for their delay on my behalf. Make no mistake, this is a subversive gesture toward Philip III. The Lion Keeper recognizes as much. He promised him to relate that valiant deed to the king himself when he arrived at court. And Don Quixote pushes his encounter with the monarch even further. If by chance his majesty should ask who performed this deed, tell him it was the Knight of the Lions. This is the first time since leaving home that Don Quixote gives himself a new moniker, replacing the Knight of the Sorrowful Face from part one. This alone should indicate the importance of this episode. How much money does the adventure of the lions cost Don Quixote? A, two maravedis. B, two reales. C, two escudos. Correct answer, C, two escudos. The narrator then tells us that Miranda is amazed, even somewhat respectful toward Don Quixote. Miranda's perspective is a wonderfully Erasmian summation of Don Quixote's dual nature, a sane madman and a madman on the brink of sanity. The chapter ends with a long speech by Don Quixote in which he belittles courtly knights, again as inferior in comparison with knights errant. But let the knight errant search all the corners of the earth, let him enter into the most intricate labyrinths. When Don Quixote observes that knights errant only seek fame, seeking dangerous adventures with the intention of bringing them to a happy and fortunate end, his only purpose being to achieve glorious and lasting fame, he is citing Cicero, the greatest Republican enemy of the Roman emperors. It's another sophisticated slap at Philip III and his advisors. That's all for now. Please join us in our next video. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.